Hello and welcome to turning your newsletter into a money raising donor bonding machine. I am so excited that you're here today. I wanted to introduce myself. I'm Shannon Doolittle and I'm the co-founder of the nonprofit story conference, storytelling conference with my mastermind and partner in crime, Chris Davenport. And we've had so much fun hosting webinars for conference alumni that we decided we wanted to do them for do-gooders everywhere. And that's you. And that's why we're here today with two amazing speakers. But but before I introduce you to those powerhouses, I wanted to share a few housekeeping notes. First, for those of you that are brand new to the GoToWebinar platform, let me introduce you to the control panel. On the screen, you should be seeing a little screenshot of what is on the right-hand side of your screen. That orange button, if you press that, that's gonna open your control panel or that will hide your control panel. From there, you can do a couple of things. You can select your audio preference. For those of you that are listening with your computer, you've chosen mic and speakers, and if if you find that your the sound quality isn't great or your it's not connecting well it might just be your internet connection sometimes those are slow and if that's the case go ahead and choose telephone and the dial-in information will pop up and you can call in using the telephone also, please feel free to submit your questions using the question box. You won't be able to see all the questions everyone is asking, but we will see the questions that you ask and we will have time for Q&A. And also, if you're going to tweet at all, we know we have a number of live tweeters, you can use the hashtag NPStoryConf. That way we can track it, we can retweet it, and we can thank you for being on today's webinar. So. I am beyond thrilled to introduce you to your presenters today. These two gentlemen have so much in common. Jeff Brooks is on the left and Steven Screen is on the right, and they both live and work in Seattle. So that's one thing. They are both creative directors. Um, Jeff Brooks is the creative director at True Sense Marketing. Steven Screen is a creative director and co-founder of the Better Fundraising Company. And not only are these two phenomenal fundraisers, but they are naturally gifted writers, or as I like to call them, word whisperers. So you are really in for a treat today hearing from them. And uh, one other thing that they share in common, although there's probably so much more, is that they actually are podcast producers. Together, they do a really great informative fundraising podcast called Fundraising is Beautiful. And if it's not a podcast you're familiar with, get familiar with it now. It's one of my favorites. I've been listening to it um, over the years and they share the best nuggets. So to get more information for that, you can go to fundraisingisbeautiful.com. So what they don't share in common, however, is what they would be if they weren't fundraisers. So I asked Jeff, if you weren't a fundraiser, what would you be? And Jeff told me he would be a classical musician, which I love. And I asked Stephen what he would be. And if he wasn't a fundraiser, he would be working with the Foreign Service Office. So gentlemen, welcome. I'm so excited to have you here today and have at it. All right, thank you, Shannon. Yep, thanks, Shannon. Okay, well, we're going to go through and talk about what, what you can do to create a donor-focused newsletter. It is an almost magical thing for improving um, the health of your donor file. It makes money, and it improves uh, uh, donor retention over time when you do it right. There's a lot of newsletters that are not done right, and we're going to talk about some of the differences there. So here's what we're going to do. First, we're going to talk about what a donor-focused newsletter is and isn't. Then we're going to share with you five secrets to success with your newsletter. And finally, I'm going to show you two test results uh, that may shock and surprise you. Okay, first, here's the most important thing. Who is the audience of your donor-focused newsletter? Well, then the calling it donor-focused newsletter may give it away, but your audience is donors. Now, that's the key. That's the most important thing about them, uh, about your, your newsletters, and it's this, what causes success as opposed to failure. Here's what it's not, and this not is a list of things that we see all the time. 
from uh, donor from newsletters from from nonprofit organizations. Sometimes they write newsletters that are really aimed at the staff, making the staff feel better about their work. Sometimes they're aimed at their executive director. Sometimes you have to do that. Very often it's aimed at the board. Similarly, sometimes you kind of get stuck in that position because they have the authority to make your life miserable. And it's not your friends. Okay? It's really important to keep in mind that you are not aimed at internal audiences, but at the external audience of donors. That's right. Uh, thanks, Jeff. And the one thing that we say all the time is that your fundraising is not for you, mainly because you are not at all like your donors, most likely. So we're going to get into that a little bit here, but it's just really good to remember that your fundraising is not for you. It's not designed to help you give a gift, to encourage your board to give a gift to your staff at all. It's not for you. It's your donors. And then the other thing I'll mention here, this, this bit of context for all of the stuff that Jeff and I are going to be presenting in the next 45 minutes or so, is that this isn't what we like or dislike. This is more or less, this is down to a newsletter science. These are the things that we've been testing for over 20 years and uh, done hundreds, maybe thousands of these things. And these are, these are the truths about newsletters that we have found over and over again tend to help you raise money. Yeah, and, and maybe I should mention here that we are talking specifically about print newsletters. Uh, yeah, a, lot, a lot of these principles do apply to uh, email newsletters, but not quite. Um, and my experience with online newsletters is that they aren't as powerful as print newsletters. Uh, that's not to say they're bad in any way, and that you can apply these principles. You're just not going to get some of the powerful uh, results. And that's because the email is a colder medium than print. Print, is, print has some magic that email doesn't have. So uh, if you aren't doing a print newsletter, you're doing an email only, I strongly, strongly can, uh, encourage you to go to, uh, to add a print newsletter to your schedule. It is probably worth it. Yeah, I'd, I would second that and say that an email newsletter can help your print newsletter but cannot replace your print uh, donor center newsletter. Uh, at, at least it, never in my experience have I seen an email newsletter uh, outperform a printed newsletter in, in terms of net revenue or in terms of helping donor retention. And that again, that goes back to because we are, as fundraisers, are almost always different than our donors. And one of the main things is our donors are usually older and more responsive to snail mail. That's right. Okay, so here's what the purpose of the donor focused newsletter is. First and foremost and almost entirely, it's to make your donors feel like the heroes that they are. Everything that's in there has to make them go, oh wow. That's amazing. I didn't have any idea that how great it was when I gave. Yep. This, and I would. Sorry, Jeff. Go ahead. Yeah. This is the thing to put up on, above your desk where you see it while you're working, and to constantly remind yourself: Is what I'm putting in the newsletter at this point? Is this help them feel their heroism? Yeah. And the second ingredient I would add to this is to that. The, the function that your newsletter serves is to report back to donors on what happened because they gave a gift. We know that most organizations don't do a great job of letting their donors know that the world is different, that the world is a better place, that someone was helped because of that donor's gift. And that's one of the main reasons retention rates are so low today. So your, your donor newsletter reports back to the donor on how their gift made a difference and does it in a way that makes them feel like a hero. Not your partner, but the hero of the story. Yeah. Okay. I'm getting a delay here. And I might just add that um, a lot of donors are kind of afraid you are a scam. And this is maybe one of the places that you show them, no, you're not a scam. Okay, here, here, let's look at the difference between an organization-focused and a donor-focused newsletter. Here's just a headline from an organizational-focused newsletter. Long-term care division changes name. 
that is a really big deal within the organization when your some your division of some kind changes its name. Huge, huge. I don't deny that in any way. But think about that. Does that help your donor feel heroic? Well, you're lucky if it keeps them awake, this particular type of headline. Here's what you want to see instead in a donor-focused newsletter. There we go. Jenna, I'm having to press the, the forward button about three times to get it to go forward here. Okay, donor-focused newsletter would have a story like this. Alaska winter, no match for your warmth and caring. So this is a story about a beneficiary, but put giving the credit to the donor. It said, you did this. And when you read the, the article, the whole thing would be about the change that happened in this person's life, and it gives credit to the donor. That's the absolute key to success for a donor-focused newsletter. So, most of your content is the beautiful change that happened in the world and how the donor made it possible. Because this is, in most cases, it's the only source of this critical information. And, and like Stephen just said, most organizations aren't doing this. They are not going back to their donors and saying, hey, your gift came in, we got it, we put it to work, and it made the world a better place. They just don't get that. If you do, you're going to stand head and shoulders out of the that particular donor's portfolio of compassion. Yeah, if you could, if you get good at this, if you get good at making donors really feel like their gift made a difference, you can run circles around most of the fundraisers and fundraising organizations today, because most organizations tend to look at a donation more like a product purchase, which is where the donation was made and then bam, that ends the transaction. But really good fundraisers know that that's only half of the transaction because the donor has no idea if their gift made a difference. The only thing that they get in return for making their donation is a, a hit of dopamine that makes them feel great. That's that uh, warm glow that we get uh, after making a donation. And they get your communications. That's it. And so the job of your communications, as, as the slide says, that your communications are their, the donor's only source of the critical information that they made a change in the world. So uh, your communications have to do that job well, and the best place for it for them to do it is in newsletters. And you do it with stories, not statistics. And I think you're, since you're all here uh, via the nonprofit storytelling conference, you know that that statistics. Do not move the human heart. Stories do. So please don't brag about how many hundreds of thousands of this and that happened. Tell them stories. That's the only way their heart is going to understand. Yeah, tell them stories about one person whose life was changed. And then here's, here's a pro tip for all you newsletter writers out there. In every newsletter article, there are two protagonists. One is uh, the, the beneficiary, the person whose life was changed, and two, the donor. So work work the donor into the beneficiary's story as quickly as you can in the article, again, using stories, not statistics. And all of a sudden, you are involved, they are involved emotionally in the story, involved emotionally in your organization and cause, and then retention rates and giving rates go way up. That's right. Okay. Once again, I'm struggling to push this slide forward. And if it's easier, uh, Jeff, sorry, Shannon, um, you can just tell me next, and then I can click it for you. Um, but I do, I do have a quick question from Angie, who asked, "Can you use statistics if you're if you use a story to illustrate them?" Um, short answer is no. Uh, I wouldn't say that you would never, ever in any way do it, but uh, research on, on uh, human psychology is that statistics actually turn people off, make them uncompassionate, uncaring, and unconnected. Um, 
So I would go very light on that. You, you know, you might say, here's the story of one individual whose life was changed, and she was one of 8,000 like her. But I would really bury that 8,000 and make sure that it's not sticking out uh, as the main fact. And then, that's great. And then Nicole asks, do you want to emphasize the action the donor took or the outcome that was realized because of the donor's actions? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, the, uh, yes. Yes. Jeff, I'll, I'll, take the, I'll take this one. The you absolutely want to affirm the donor for taking action and specifically speak directly to her. Um, I, I say her because most donors are female, uh, and affirm her, like I said. And then you want to talk about the outcome. And there's there's genius in that question because most most donors. Yeah, uh, I mean, there's so there are three people in every charitable transaction. There's the beneficiary, the donor, and the organization. And most organizations in their fundraising talk about the organization most. But the two people that the donor cares about most are herself and the uh, beneficiary who they helped. So our communications ought to be about donors and beneficiaries much more than they are about the process, the organization by which the magic happened. Next. Okay, there, there's some other stuff you can have in there. I, I found that's good. You can have people as in beneficiaries saying thanks. That's a sweet little article where somebody says, thanks, here's what happened. I'm so glad that people like you gave. Um, stories about donors can be good, and I would just make the warning, don't make them your major and super donors. Make them ordinary donors. Um, you, uh, this, uh, a particular type of story that I like is a child who's been giving, like who set up a lemonade stand and, and gave the proceeds, things like that, that help people um, see how good giving is. And then the third category, and again, don't overdo this. This should be a small part of your newsletter, is other ways they can be involved. Um, now, most newsletter, most fundraising, or excuse me, nonprofit newsletters I see, it's all this stuff. Well, in a donor-focused newsletter, this is the small part. It would be volunteering opportunities, announcements of your events, uh, advocacy opportunities, uh, planned giving, all that stuff, the things that you want your donors to do. That can all be in there, but just make it secondary. The big point is the you are a hero stuff. I love this question from Judy. Um, she's very specific. She says, in our case, the beneficiaries are fish and wildlife via protection of the environment. Does that mean warm and fuzzy stories about animals and birds? I would say yes. Um, yeah. think, think about what the donor wanted to happen when they gave and describe that. And I, I imagine, since it's uh, fish and wildlife, we can't talk to the fish very well. But we can talk about the beautiful landscapes and the change that happened and that sort of thing. And that, that can be quite good. And you're obviously going to have to feature humans in these stories to do the talking. Uh, but they would be humans who uh, live and work in those places. And you could talk about specific benefits to the fish and wildlife, breathing cleaner air or cleaner water, uh, all, all those types of granular, understandable details that can make the donor feel like, yeah, I, I made that water cleaner, I made that air easier to breathe, that kind of stuff. Yeah, next. Okay, here's what not to do. You're gonna be sorely tempted to do this. Your boss is gonna force you to do this. People on your staff are gonna complain if you don't do this, but don't put in education pieces. Your goal is not to educate donors. Your goal is to make them feel good. And the ones who feel good will go out and educate themselves. But you do not want to teach them about your processes and the need and the big picture. That's not going to, um, it's not going to be read. And it's not going to effectively educate them either. And it's not going to improve retention. And it's not going to bring in net revenue. Uh, I would stay away from staff profiles. There may be cases where that's interesting, but mostly not. Is people really aren't that interested in your staff and, you know, Let's be frank, how interesting are we anyway? Um, another thing that often a lot of these newsletters have is maybe an educated a, a, a director or somebody has a soapbox where he goes on and on about some his what he cares about. 
stay away from that. It is great to have a column by the president or CEO or uh, executive director talking to the donors, but basically he needs to talk to the donors about the donors and not about his issues. Uh, and finally, please don't brag about other big donors. Um, I see this so often, it's so discouraging and horrible when we basically tell all the regular $25, 50 and $100 donors that we've got these awesome $10,000 and $100,000 donors out there. You don't need to tell them that. If you need to thank those large donors in some public way, find a different way. Don't use your donor newsletter to do that. Yeah, I've been involved in multiple tests where we sent out two different versions of newsletters. One included a story about a large donor or a large grant being received. And in every instance, the newsletter that had the, uh, the news about the big gift received raised less money than the other versions of newsletters. Uh, so we want to be really careful about this. And all of this really is conceptually in the same boat that we were talking about earlier, where the donor is more interested in the beneficiary than she is in specifically how that beneficiary was helped. So an education piece, a staff profile, uh, somebody's soapbox, that's the third most important thing on her list, uh, down um, from being affirmed as a person who made a compassionate gift and down from being told about how she made the world a better place. That's right. Next. Do we have a question while we, while we move along? Well, Jeff, the next slide is that uh, our newsletters should be producing net revenue. Should we talk about that for a little bit while this comes up? I'm sorry. Yes. I'm sorry, you two. I was actually muted. Um, real quick question um, that about the last one because it kept coming up in the question box. There's just a number of organizations that feel that they're not confident or they're a little nervous about telling stories of their beneficiaries, whether they're disenfranchised youth or their um, their homeless um, families or or other other issues where there might be, um, they don't want to feel like they're betraying their beneficiaries by telling their stories. Do you have yeah. tips or thoughts about walking people through how to do that? Yes, and that is a real issue. It's something you have to be very aware of and careful about. Uh, this, is, this would be when, say, we're in the community and the beneficiaries are here in the community uh, and they may have privacy issues. And there's a couple things you need to do. Um, one is, Whenever you, whenever you want to do a story about a particular beneficiary, make absolutely sure you have that person's complete and conscious uh, permission uh, to be in a member of the story. The other thing you might do is just like make sure that this is the right person in the first place. Um, I have seen uh, cases where uh, we talked to somebody, they, they, the story was great, but then we found out, well, they were at a place in their recovery where going public would be a huge mistake. And that was a sort of a caseworker's judgment. And the last thing you want to do is uh, undermine somebody's personal journey by putting in the newsletter. But on the most part, people are happy to tell their stories uh, when, they, when, you, when they give permission. There are cases when you need to change their name to protect their privacy. There are cases when you may not use their photo or use their photo with, uh, you know, with, uh, pixelating their face or something like that to hide their identity. Those are all fair. Those are all things you may need to do. But yeah, it, it's an issue, and don't not think about it. But that, but we would say that the default setting ought to be to try to figure out how to tell those stories using some of the techniques that Jeff just mentioned, uh, because if if you're not telling those stories, you're taking the single most important tool out of the toolbox. Yeah, that's right. All right, next. So you, can, yeah. Okay. Here are the five secrets. Let's go to the next. Okay. Number one is be interesting, and I'm almost embarrassed that I have to say that, but honestly, when you look in your mailbox, and I think you all probably have seen this, 
Nonprofit newsletters as a whole are really, really, really boring. Uh, they are not going out of their way to make uh, to to be interesting, to shine through the, all the clutter that are in our donors' lives. Remember, our donors get 1,500 marketing messages per day, and your newsletter is part of that noise. And if it's not interesting, it's a whisper in the middle of a hurricane. So let's talk about what that means next. There's a class of newspapers, we call them tabloids, that's the size of paper they're usually printed on, that are all about being interesting. Uh, this particular one is more about being interesting than about being true, uh, which of course we don't want to do. But they have learned what people are interested in reading and they've distilled it into a science of headlines and images. And they're very good at those two things, headlines and images, and you should be too is find out the you know, right headlines that are going to just irresistibly draw people in. Yeah, don't assume that people are going to read the newsletter or the headlines or the articles because the work that you're doing is so powerful or the changes in the beneficiaries' lives are so great. To make it through the noise of those 1,500 marketing messages a day, and I think it's higher than that now, you, you have to be... Uh, you have to be looking out for what's interesting, the interesting, dramatic parts of the stories, and lead with those. Don't assume people are going to read it. Okay, next. Okay, let's just take a quick look at what's interesting versus not interesting. Interesting are stories about people, people's relationships, people and celebrities, people doing heroic things, life drama, people coming back from the from. Uh, near death and things like that, people being found after being lost, those kinds of things. Also interesting are life-affirming thoughts. People really like to be given um, you know, reasons to hope, reasons to be strong, reasons to care, those sort of things. Uh, they love reading about practical health. Uh, I know a lot of health-oriented nonprofits will have uh, healthy recipes in their donor newsletters. People love that kind of and then maybe most important of all, photos of people. So let me go down the not interesting column <laughs> just to bring it out. Statistics equals nobody reads. Opinions are not interesting. I know you think they are. They aren't. Uh, everybody, we have too many opinions floating around in our world and having a, a newsletter that's about real life and not somebody's opinions, what a relief. Statistics are also not interesting, again. Uh, lectures are not good. People don't want lectures. People don't need them. They don't listen to them. Uh, statistics are not uh, interesting to most people. Bragging is one of the worst things you can do, and it's very tempting to brag because you have a, you have excellent programs and they work really well, and you want to brag about them. You probably have brand guidelines that sort of force you to brag. Don't brag. Brag about the donor, and don't show pictures of buildings. They really aren't interesting, no matter how great they are. Uh, the exception might be if you were some kind of historic trust kind of thing like that where buildings are the cost. Yeah, or maybe if you did a capital campaign and you're reporting back to capital campaign donors. But what one thing to, one thing to pull out of this list uh, is the second to the last one, the bragging. Most nonprofits don't realize how often they brag. And it's kind of a turnoff to donors. It's one of the ingredients in the low retention rate stew that we have going on in our industry. But anytime you're saying, hey, our programs are great, we did this, we did that, um, uh, let us tell you about the amazing effects that we had on this thing thanks to your partnership. All of that stuff for the donors at least for the vast majority of donors, comes across as bragging. Because they are more interested in what they, she is more interested in what she's doing than what you guys are doing. And especially, that's especially true when it feels like the donor made a gift to make something happen and the organization via language takes credit for it. Like, look at what we did. Uh, that's, that's, uh, why, why, would you ever, why would you ever give another gift to an organization that takes the credit? So important. 
Next. Quick, quick question for both of you before we move on. There's a lot of people that are getting sort of confused by the edu the educational pieces. So someone's asking, doesn't practical help? Doesn't that count as education? So maybe you could just sort of give people an idea either of ratio or, or, or how you do that. Someone had also said they spent a lot of time in their newsletter talking about how to manage symptoms or what causes a specific illness. And they're wondering, are we giving up valuable real estate like how do we transition and provide that info elsewhere if we shouldn't be putting practical help or that information in a newsletter I, I would think in that case uh, where a large part of your audience is people who are managing the disease I imagine that's the case um, do put that in there that's practical to them and I would draw a line between that and education education is um, to me it's where we abstractly teach them about something as opposed to give them something they can use. So I'd say, yes, do put that in. Managing your symptoms, that kind of stuff, that should be in there, although that's secondary. It should be secondary to the how you are making the world a better place material. Yeah, and I'd add to that by, by giving an, an example in that uh, many, many times, uh, say, say an organization is working on homelessness, They'll, there will be a column in there that says, um, let us tell you about those with homelessness and why this is such an important issue in our city today. That right there is education. That's trying to take a donor who was just happy to help somebody get a meal and maybe a safe place to stay and trying to educate them into say homelessness 201 or homelessness 301 when really the donor isn't that interested in that. She's wondering if her gift made a difference. Yeah. So in, instead of instead of going down that track, that would we would call education. We would say stay focused on people who the donor's gift helped, and don't assume that they're that interested in the rest of the conceptual stuff that staff, board, uh, and and everybody else find interesting internally. That and you know I might add that the practical thing you might do in that case, a homeless uh, charity, would be. Uh, how to have a positive interaction with a homeless person. Like give them, give them hints, like we, we encounter them uh, out on the streets. What's the right thing to do and behave? Should you give them money? Should you do this? Should you do that? that that's different from education. That's practical help. That is so helpful. Thank you. OK. Number two, uh, secret for success, write and design for skimming. Um, when we when we create our newsletters, we write these, these articles, we work really hard, make them really good, and we often have the assumption that people start with the first word of the article and read every word until the end. Guess what? That doesn't really happen. On a statistical basis, virtually nobody reads that way. Most people fly through your articles. They, they are pulled in by headlines, by pull quotes, by whatever. They might read uh, the end of your article and not the beginning. Uh, they just bounce around. That's normal behavior. It's the, uh, you know, if you actually be examine yourself, you do it too. Uh, but if you design under the belief that that's the way it works, you're going to do it better. So let's take a look at some of the things that we do to make them skinnable. Jeff, can I take this one? So the, the, the biggest mistake that many nonprofit newsletters make is that they assume they are going to be read. And that's a big mistake. And so what we want to, what we're doing here on this page is uh, really echoing Jeff's assertion that most people don't read these things; they skim them. And so we're going to make it really easy for people who are skimming, who are the vast majority of your readers, to get your point. So you want to have great headlines, uh, that because most people are going to read the 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 headlines and the picture captions. Uh, you want to have white space. You don't want to, there to be just a wall of text for people to wade through. You want to give people's eyes a break. You want to have subheads which are and, and pull quotes, which are, again, assuming that people are bouncing around and not reading the whole thing, visually highlight the things that are most important for them to read uh, and do it, do it with design. For photos, you want to have them with captions. Uh, because people read photo captions. If you don't have if you don't have captions on your photos, uh, that is that is a, a, a gross waste of uh, real estate because people want to read it. 
Uh, you want to have short articles. Um, I mean, most of, most of the newsletter articles we write are 300 to 400 words, so they're not very long. And then you want to have a low grade level of writing, and that there is no value judgment there. I wish there was a different term, because most people assume that means we're uh, writing for people that aren't that smart. But really, you're writing for people that are reading really quickly, and you need to make it as easy for them to understand as possible. Okay. Next. So we're gonna, we, we, we made great headlines as a category by itself because it's so, so extremely important. So let's go to next. Okay, here's, here's the, the basics on headline writing for great newsletters. Make sure there's a strong action verb. Now there's a kind of a, a journalistic style of headlines where there's no verb. Uh, don't do that. Always have a great verb and, and you know, write five versions of it until you find the verb, that, the one that really sings. And at the same time, avoid ing verbs. They take the air out of your headline. They make it, they make, even if it's a strong verb, it makes it sound more like an ongoing process than news. And I'm going to show you some examples of how that, how, how uh, painful that can be uh, at bringing down the power of your headline. Um, it's good to have multiple elements. By that I mean you might have a main headline that's big and a little kicker above and or a subhead right below the main headline. It's okay to do that. Check out how the National Enquirer and those other tabloids do that. They make great use of multiple elements in headlines. Um, including conflict is great so that the headline tells you about conflict and the headline has people in it so it might have uh, a name of a person or a description of a person and the, and the conflict they're in. The conflict might even be with themselves or with their, uh, with their addiction or whatever the issue is. But conflict and people are the main ingredients. And really, not always, but often, address the reader. Like, literally have the word you in the headline. Um, another kind of cool thing you can do from time to time, and the price of this has gone really low, is literally make it personalized so you can put the donor's actual name in the headline. It can be quite powerful. Okay, here's some examples of headlines. Uh, Dan is living a life that would make his dad proud. Uh, we have a person, we have a dad, we have a situation. Okay, here's another one. Soldier and family rescued from every homeowner's nightmare. And then below that you have the subhead. And that increases it. Let's look at the next one. This is this last headline is a real headline that I really saw in a real newsletter, and I, I put that in there because that is about as bad as it gets. Um, I think I, I blogged about this a while ago, and I called it the tied with about seven thousand others for the worst headline ever, um, because it happens so often. What you have there is. Partner as a verb, partner is a terrible verb, it doesn't mean anything really, plus it's an ing verb and there are no people in it. The story was actually pretty interesting, it was about some stuff they were doing in a very poverty stricken and conflict area to make a difference and this is, this is the headline they came up with. Basically, uh, it would have been better if it said, caution, do not read this story, it's boring. <laughs> More people would have read it if that were the headline. Yeah, the, the blurb that we use is you want to be National Enquirer, not National Geographic with your headlines. So uh, th think we, we have to earn the reader's interest and your headline has to be great. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be you know, something we throw on at the end. Uh, it, it ought to be really powerful. All right, number four, the right photos. They are very, very important. Next, this is it. The, a human face making eye contact, that's your best uh, possible uh, photo. And I'll, I'll, ex, I'll ex, extend human to include animals. Um, you, but eye contact with a face, that's the thing. Babies are great. And I'm going to show you next the, the photo never to use. Let's look at that. Please, don't use this photo. I, I know I see, you see it all the time. This photo is not only really boring, but the, the story it tells is 
you, $50 donor, don't matter that much because somebody else gave a big gift with a big check. Not only was the, the amount big, but the check itself was big, and we are thrilled about that, not about you. So put on your list of not allowed ever is this photo. And finally, ask. You want to take that one, Stephen? Sure. The primary purpose of the newsletter is to report back to donors on what a difference their gift made in the world. And it should also give them a chance to make another gift today if they would like to do that. And so your, your newsletter should absolutely, and so we've been testing this recently and have had very great success with on the back page of your newsletter having a story that we call a story of need that shows that there is still more work to be done today and then uh, asking the donor to help. A lot of, donor, a lot of donors are motiv motivated by need, so they give well to your appeals. A lot of donors are motivated uh, by gratitude, so they give well in response to thank you notes and to receipts. A lot of donors are motivated to take part in more success, which they read about in your newsletters. So your newsletter should absolutely include a call to action and a way to send in a gift today. Yeah, and you should be making money with your newsletter. Um, in the old days, we didn't expect them to make money, but when we started discovering these principles, we started making money. Some organizations raise more from newsletters than they do from appeals. Uh, that's not universal. Others don't. My, in my observation, local organizations tend to do well, uh, best with newsletters, and religious organizations also tend to do very well with newsletters. There's something about those two types of audiences. So let's look at two amazing tests that, that we've run. I've actually run this particular test several times because my clients keep asking this question and keep needing their own proof that it's true. But here's the first one. Uh, this is a self-mailer, the one you see uh, below, where it's, uh, the magazine is, uh, excuse me, the newsletter is just folded over and you can see how it's kind of got those little tabs that hold it closed. There is often a small uh, envelope uh, stitched in or stapled in in here, and that's the whole thing. Well, we've tested that against what you see on the left there, and that is where the, the uh, newsletter is in an envelope. Let's go to the next to see the results of that test. Here's the response rate difference. Almost three times more response, and this is one, one test, but it has gone this way every time. The envelope newsletter does way better. And surprisingly, the average gift is also higher from the envelope. Very often when you have a higher response rate, you get a lower average gift. But in this case, you got higher of both, which results in the, what we see on the next slide, which here's the revenue difference. Um, the envelope version got 250%, 254% more revenue than the self-mailer. Now, the self-mailer is marginally cheaper than the envelope one, but as you can see, it's way worth the extra you spend to, to put the piece in an envelope. It includes a reply coupon and a return envelope. Jasper. So for all the organizations out there that are using um, self-mailers for their newsletters, we would recommend wholeheartedly to move to sending your newsletter in an outer envelope uh, with a reply card and a reply envelope. Yes, it will be more expensive, and you may have a hard time getting approval for that expense, but it's absolutely worth your time and your money. Why do you think the envelope matters, you two? Like, what is it about the envelope? Uh, my theory is it's perceived value. Uh, that In an envelope, it seems like an important piece, and the self-mailer doesn't. I have no proof of that hypothesis, but this test goes this way every time. It's very clear this is the way to go. Does the size of the envelope matter? I don't think so. Uh, typically, I, I, my newsletters I do are in the number 10 envelope. I've done them also in a sort of a 6 by 9 size envelope. Um, I could see them in, in other bigger sizes, but I think the envelope is the magic. Yeah, agreed. The only time I've seen size of envelope matter is when we were mailing the newsletter to major donors, and it didn't work that well when we put it in a number 10, but when we put it in larger envelopes, it worked great. 
Great. Okay. There's there's a gazillion questions coming in. I'll let you do the second test, and then hopefully we can get to a few of these as we end. Okay. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, we tested having no reply device in the uh, in the newsletter, um, and in the in the test version there was no reply device. There was a return envelope, but no reply device. So let's look at what happened. Again, you see like a more than doubling of response. So that reply device really does bring in the gifts. And here's the case where we saw uh, a, a shift in average gift. The higher response rate got the lower average gift. And those people who gave more, they, they had to struggle to send their gifts. So they were the ones who were maybe more determined and so we got a higher average gift. But when you put those together, let's look at the revenue result. It was 111% difference in revenue to have a reply coupon in there. So don't, don't, don't leave that out. It's going to cost you big time. If somebody's asking what the difference is between a reply device and an envelope, or we're talking about business reply envelopes or BREs, right? Gentlemen? Yes. Uh, uh, BREs or CREs, which is where um, the donor has to put a stamp on it. Okay. Um, the reply device is the coupon that says, yes, here's my gift of, and then there's some choices, and it has the codes and things on it that help us process the gift. That's, that's what the reply device is, as opposed to an envelope. There are some uh, cases where the reply device is on the flap of the envelope. It has a big has a long flap, so you can put that stuff called a bang tail envelope. That's sometimes, um, I have not tested that. Um, I'd actually be interested. My clients don't like them. I love, but, um, that, I love that you just said that because Amy just asked that same question and then said, is there a study or have you tested this? So you answered that. <laughs> yeah, the, the one piece of color that I'd add here is that most smaller organizations tend to have a standard reply envelope that uh, has pre-filled out gift amounts and a place for the donor to write all their stuff. In all of our testing, we would recommend not sending those to donors because they are not personal enough. And just to sort of shine a spotlight on what Jeff was going through right here, this is a separate reply card that's printed with the donor's name and some gift amounts on there that are uh, based on how much the donor gave before. This is not just a generic card. Uh, when, when I have tested sending out pre-printed envelopes with a whole bunch of gift amounts on the inside flap, those have depressed response and we've raised less money. So there, there's your answer. I, uh, I haven't done that test, but that's a good one. So is there a test on BREs versus CREs? Uh, I've tested that many, many, many times and the short answer about that is it doesn't matter. Uh, what you see is if you always do a BRE and then you test a CRE, it does better and vice versa. So uh, change is good. Uh, change uh, bumps response up a bit. Um, but in, on the whole, uh, those kind of things just don't really move the, new, the needle. And a, and a ton of questions, this specific question. Um, do you always advocate putting text on the outer envelope? Should there always be something on the outside? For a newsletter, yes. Uh, and the, the magic word is newsletter. Uh, there's a lot, of things, a lot of things you can do, but the, the, it should say this is a newsletter. And I think that's because donors, uh, generally they want newsletters. We actually get that from surveys and things. They say, yeah, I, I wish I got a newsletter. Um, and when donors complain about getting too much mail, they're almost never complaining about a newsletter when they make that complaint. Yep. And that's happening because so few donors know what their gift did. Right? They want to know and they sort of assume the newsletter is going to tell them what they're gifted. So um, hopefully your newsletter is doing that. And then the, the teaser we use sort of as a default setting for newsletters is your newsletter enclosed, exclamation point. Um, if, if you don't have the capability of pre-printing uh, envelopes for every version of your newsletter, you can at least print a few thousand that say your newsletter enclosed and use those for hopefully the handful of newsletters that you send out each year. 
And for those of you that are asking, a BRE is a business reply envelope, and that means you've already paid the postage. And a CRE is a courtesy reply envelope, and that's where a donor or one of your supporters needs to affix their own first class stamp. So thank you for asking that. Um, hopefully that helps. And another question for you both, is there ever a time when you don't wanna put an envelope in a newsletter, or do you always wanna put an envelope, a reply device in? I'd say always. Yeah, I can't imagine a, an occasion when you would uh, give somebody the opportunity to give. The, the working assumption we go with here is people want to give. Uh, so don't make them go find an envelope and figure out what your address is and, and, and do it all. Just make it easy. This is great. And we still have a few minutes and we're going to answer questions for everyone. So um, there's a ton out there still. Thank you, Jeff and Stephen. I wanted to real quick tell you that you can actually meet Jeff and Stephen live. I said earlier when I started this that the Nonprofit Storytelling Conference is the host for this webinar. We're going to have a number of webinars over the next few weeks, which is based in Seattle or will be this year. And we invite you to come hang out with us if you'd like. You can learn more information. Jeff and Stephen will be there. They'll both be on stage along with a number of other fun people like Tammy Zonker, Vanessa Chase, Tom Ahern, Mark Pittman, Harvey McKinnon, just a lot of um, names of people that do amazing work. So if you want to come, please check us out and learn more. Um, what I love is that you have access to the speakers for two full days. Jeff is actually sitting in the room with you, same as Stephen, hanging out at tables, answering your questions. It's a really cool thing. So Jeff and Steven, you have shared some amazing information with us today. I wanna thank you, but are you ready to take just a few more questions? Sure, of course. Great, so one question that has come up is, my leadership wants to talk about us. Our board, one person said, our board just voted that the newsletter needs to focus on education only. So what do you do when leadership does not agree or isn't gonna give you the green light to change things? How do you, how do you move the needle? What, how do you, you know, what conversations do you have? What tips do you have to get them to understand it needs to be more donor focused? Yeah, that, that's a tough position to be in. It's really hard to make leaders who are kind of used to being considered right that they're wrong. <laughs> um, but I, the best I can, the advice I can give you is to say, hey, the, the best practices in the industry tell us otherwise. Uh, go listen to this webinar. Read Tom Ahern's book about newsletters. It is dynamite. It is full of great stuff, and, it, and it, uh, everything you've heard today you will find in some form in that book and say, this is the way it needs to be. Uh, you might, if you have enough of a file, consider doing a test uh, where you do it the, the boss's way and then you do it the donor-centered way. Um, I can almost guarantee you that you're going to kick that kick their version's butt in that test. Um, now, the problem with tests is you have to rather rather large quantities to get a statistical read. But if they can't listen to what the industry knows, they, aren't, they don't really belong in the industry. And I know you can't say that to them, but just know that maybe you need to consider finding a better place to work if, it's, if you can't change their wrong thinking. Great, and everyone's asking about that book. I'm gonna put it in the, the box so you can see it, but the author is Tom Ahern, and the book is called Making Money with Donor Newsletters. And Jeff doesn't know that I'm doing this, but quick plug, Jeff just released his, his new book, and as a young fundraiser, I devoured anything written by Tom Ahern as well as Jeff Brooks. So I just wanna say, if you haven't seen Jeff's new book, um, everyone's all a Twitter about it on social media, grab a copy because you can't not make more money, raise more money, retain more donors, all of those good stuff. I mean, you're going to do that if you if you read anything that Jeff or Steven are talking about on the podcast or what they're including on their blogs. And for those of you, if you're not following their blogs already, over there on the right on your screen are the address to their blogs. Definitely bookmark those because I hope you are reading them. It's only going to make you a better fundraiser. So quick question for you. Oh, and Jeff, what's the name of your new book? I'm I totally putting them on the spot. I did not plan this. Yeah. Yeah, okay, uh, let's see. It's called How to Turn Your Words into Money. And it's a, it's 
about fundraising writing. It's very specifically aimed at those of us who have to write fundraising. I love it. Yeah, I already, I just bought it on Amazon this morning. So, hey, another yeah. reader coming your way. So question for you, Stephen. A lot of people are asking about, you know, this newsletter, I understand that you want to, you want it to speak to your, to your annual donors or maybe to donors that aren't making large gifts. But what about our major donors? How do we make sure they're taking care of, they're getting the reports that they want, the stories they need? Because some of our major donors, they want to know that there's a return. They want to know some of that statistical stuff. How do you, um, what do you, what tips do you have for people that are asking that question? Yeah, that's a great that's a great question, and it's it, it's an important one because so much of an organization's revenue from individual donors comes from majors. Uh, so a couple couple things. Uh, number one, absolutely send your newsletter to major donors. Don't hold them out of the mail stream of newsletters uh, like a lot of organizations do. We just tested this. I got the results last week, and uh, this one organization found an extra ten thousand dollars per newsletter by sending it to major donors without affecting the overall major donor giving. So that's just uh, a data, data point that says send your newsletter to majors. And then, I mean, as, as far as letting majors know, ideally, right, uh, for the major donors, your top 10 or 25 or 50, depending on how big your organization is, you know which each of those, what each of those donors care most about and for them, it's worth it to uh, send customized reports. Basically, it's just an, a newsletter designed for one individual to let them know how their gift is making an impact in the world. Uh, one, one pro thing that we did for a mega donor for the University of Chicago was we, we did a mass donor newsletter uh, around a topic that we knew the mega donor cared deeply about it was a good topic for a newsletter, so it worked great for mass donor fundraising, but then we were able to walk over and hand it to the mega donor and say, hey, look, look, at, look at this, um, look what your gift is accomplishing, uh, and it resulted in a very large gift. I love that. Thank, yeah. you. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, one thing we've, something we've done with major donors and newsletters is put them in a 9 by 12, you know, mail them flat in a 9 by 12 envelope with a cover letter, and we'll very often just say, this is the newsletter we're sending out to our general donors, but I thought you'd be interested in it too. Um, so in a way, you're treating them as you're not part of the usual group, but I think you'll be interested anyway. And we've had very positive uh, uh, results from that. Well, wonderful. And everyone is writing in letting me know, Jeff, that your book is out of stock on Amazon at the moment. I don't know if you knew that. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> um, well, I want to be... Or anyway, it'll be in stock soon. <laughs> and for everyone that's asking two, a couple of things, one, everyone will be getting a recording of this webinar. Two, um, we will have the slides made available to you with that same link. And I will also um, link out to the books that were mentioned on today's webinar. Um, so just look for that email in the next 24 to 48 hours, and then you guys can go on a shopping spree, which is really fun. So. Um, Again, we're at 11 o'clock, but I do just want to end with one question to both of you that I would I hope you'll answer. And again, Jeff Brooks, Stephen Screen, phenomenal. The two of them are, you know, by themselves, but also together, check out their podcast, but then also check out all these great links that you're seeing over there to the right. So um, if there's just one tip or one thing that you'd like to share about donor newsletters to the audience, what would it be? Jeff, go first. The one tip uh, is, um, it's probably our first uh, secret, which was be interesting. That's so important and so overlooked. So get the spirit of entertainment while you work on it. And I'd say if you do that, that's going to get you most of the way where you want to go. Stephen? I'd say it's to understand the purpose of the newsletter. And that purpose of the newsletter is to report back to the donor on uh, how big a difference their gift made. We, we teach uh, a rhythm called ask, thank, report, repeat. You have to ask donors to help your beneficiaries. You have to thank them like crazy when you do. And then you have to report back to them on the difference in the world that their gift made. The newsletter is the best uh, vehicle for reporting. That's its job. Anything else that gets added is helping it do, helping it do its job worse. So understand the purpose and stay focused on it. 
And that's the last word from Jeff and Stephen. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here today. Thank you so much to Jeff and Stephen for sharing their time and their just amazing tips with us and strategies for making your newsletter, I love it, a donor bonding machine. I do want to end by saying we have another webinar next Tuesday with another amazing speaker, Leah Eustis, um, out of Good Works in Canada. And she's going to be talking to us about your brain on stories and how you can use some of the neuroscience and studies that have been done about your brain on stories and how you can use them in your newsletter to um, have greater, I guess, bonding with, with, with donors. So if you haven't signed up already, hop on over to our conference site and sign up for that webinar to you. So thank you so much, gentlemen, and we hope all of you have an amazing week, and we'll see you next Thanks. Tuesday. Thanks, Shannon.